So what we've seen up to this point is that adding our emitter resistor can be very helpful. So in terms of our DC analysis, it can help us stabilize the Q point against changes in beta. So oftentimes we would want to have this large emitter resistor value in order to keep that Q point stable. But we've seen that the flip side of this is that this can cause our small signal voltage gain to significantly decrease. Uh, it does have some benefit in that it's also causing that small signal voltage gain to stabilize. Um, so we do have some benefit, but we don't want to decrease that gain too much. So one solution to this, if we do need a really large RE, is that we can use something called a bypass capacitor to bypass part or all of RE. So our solution to this issue stated above is that we can use a bypass capacitor And so of course, as the name implies, we're using that to bypass part. And in rare cases, maybe we want to um, bypass all of our emitter resistor RE. And so in order to get a better idea of what this is and, and some sort of numerical reference point, let's consider a modified version of the circuit that we considered in the previous example. So of course, two videos back, we considered this circuit with no emitter resistor and we saw we had a gain of about negative 175, but it was very dependent on changes in beta. We then added this emitter resistor of 0.6 K ohms, and we saw that this reduced the gain to something around negative eight, but it was a lot more stable as beta was changing. So with this approach, we're kind of going to see, uh, we can almost sort of have our cake and eat it too, um, in that we're gonna have a reduction in gain, but it's not going to be quite as much as, as we did in in the second part of the previous example. And we're gonna have some stability, uh, but not quite as much as we do with this full RE value. So the way we're going to do this is, first of all, we're going to break up this RE into two parts. So let me go ahead and get rid of this RE and let's make sort of two resistors in series. And so we'll call them RE1 and RE2. So we get something that looks like this. And so let's say this is our RE1 up here and so let's say this is 0.1k ohms or 100 ohms and so let me move this out of the way here so our r2 can come over here and let's say that this second part of our re let's call it re2 is going to be the remaining 0.5k ohms such that in series we're still going to have the 0.6k ohms that we did initially and now what we're going to do is we're going to put a capacitor in parallel with this larger part and this capacitor we're gonna call C sub E, and this is going to be our bypass capacitor. The reason we call this a bypass capacitor is if we think about what the AC signals are seeing, uh, they're going to see that as a short circuit. So any AC signal coming down here is going to go through this capacitor and it's going to bypass that RE2. So that's why we call that a bypass capacitor. And so the functionality of that is different from this coupling capacitor up here, which is allowing AC signals through while blocking any DC signals that are trying to come that way towards our AC source. Uh, so again, sort of same, same basic idea, of course, with our capacitor impedance, but slightly different uh, application based on how it's connected in there. And so what we see with this is that we're gonna have both parts of our RE present for our DC analysis. So both RE1 and RE2 for our DC analysis, because remember our capacitor just looks like an open circuit for our DC uh, analysis. So we essentially ignore the CE and everything to the left of our coupling capacitor. And so what that means is that we're still going to have that stability of our Q point. So help set bias point and maintain our DC stability, so maintaining stability of our Q point. And so that's sort of what we want, but remember we don't want that to be reducing our gain too much. And so what we do then is because we have that bypass capacitor, only the RE1 is going to be present for our AC analysis. And so that's going to mean less of a reduction to our gain. So to get an idea sort of numerically of what that is, um, I've got some of the highlights for the DC analysis shown in the notes. 
Uh, sort of the big one though that we looked at was of course the end result of our ICQ. So that's the only one I'm gonna include here. And so we see that that is 0.418 milliamps. So if I'm not mistaken, that should be the same thing we saw for our DC analysis in the previous part. Um, yeah, so that, sh that should be the same. And so let me just note that this is on page 4-23 in the notes. And from that, we get the same R pi. So we have our R pi is, of course, VT over beta ICQ, assuming room temperature. Uh, we have the, the 0.026 millivolts times our beta, which is 120 our ICQ of the 0.418, and we get that that's approximately 7.464 K ohms. So up to this point, it's the same as just having RE, like we saw before. Now we're going to switch over and we do our AC analysis. So this was for our DC analysis. Now things are gonna look a little different when we go to, to do our AC analysis. So we're gonna have our RIB, which remember is equal to R pi plus one plus beta times the emitter resistor. But in this case, our RE2 is being bypassed. So the only one that's showing up in our AC analysis is this RE1. So this becomes RE1. And so this value is now going to be smaller. So now we have 19.564 K ohms as to oppose, I believe in the previous example, that was something on the order of 70 K ohms. So we've reduced that quite significantly. And so our RI is also going to, to be multiplied by a factor of about one half. So we have R1 parallel with R2 parallel with RIB. The only one that's changed of those three is RIB. Plugging in those values, we see that that is approximately 0 0.14.610 K ohms. We then go to our small signal voltage gain equation, negative beta RC, so remember beta was 120, divided by RIB times RI, divided by RI plus RS. And so of course we've, we've changed our RI and our RIB. The other three values are going to be the same. If we plug everything in, we see that this is approximately negative 33.212. And so, of course, that is still a lot smaller than that negative 170 that we saw with no emitter resistor. Um, however, it's about four times larger than the negative eight that we saw when we had the full emitter resistor and no bypass capacitor. So now for the other piece of the puzzle, we can consider what happens as our beta is changing. So initially it's 120. So if we have plus or minus 50%, we're at 60 or 180. And our voltage gain excuse me, our small signal voltage gain. So initially it's at 33.2. And if we redo that analysis with these different beta values, we see it decreases to negative 27.8 when our beta is 60, and it increases to negative 35.5 when our beta is 180. So if we compare this to the previous video, so part B of our previous example, we see that we have, so let's just say comparing to no bypass capacitor, which is what we looked at in the previous example, so part B of the previous example, we can say we have an increased small signal gain, so increased AV, and so that's of course a good thing, but we also have increased sensitivity to beta, which is an, a not ideal thing. So increased sensitivity, to changes in our beta, and so that is bad or undesirable. And so again, this goes back to this idea of we're always having these trade-offs, but of course we can see with this bypass capacitor, we can kind of reach some middle ground and adjust it depending on our particular application.